Hello everybody, my name is Catherine Bridick and I'm an Associate Professor of International Human Rights and Refugee Law here at the Refugee Study Centre. Along with my co-convener, Nicola Palmer, Reader in Criminal Law at the Dixon Pool School of Law, I'd like to extend this warmest of welcomes to this our first seminar on refugee protection and AAA and others. A week ago today, the UK Supreme Court held that the Secretary of State's policy to remove protection seekers to Rwanda was unlawful. Rwanda is not, at present, a safe third country. Those who faced removal, people who we know were, to quote the Refugee Council, highly distressed, anxious and traumatised at the prospect of being shipped as if they were human cargo, are, we hope, released from that fear. Now, this series both celebrates that decision and examines its implications. In January, we consider the government's response, including the proposed emergency legislation and how the judgment relates to the Illegal Migration Act. Next week, we focus on the legal and political context in Rwanda and consider the implication of the judgment for safe third country agreements, responsibility sharing and racialized inequality within the broader refugee regime. This evening, we're going to examine the judgment itself, and we have a phenomenal panel whose expertise and experience makes them uniquely placed to explain the judgment to us and to explore it from a range of different perspectives. Our first speaker this evening is Raza Hussein Casey, a barrister at Matrix Chambers and lead counsel for AAA. Our second speaker is Dr. Madeleine Garlick, Chief of Protection Policy and Legal Advice at UNHCR. Our third speaker is Catherine Costello, full professor of Global Refugee and Migration Law at University College Dublin. We're delighted that they've agreed to join us this evening. They're going to speak for around 10 minutes and then we will have time for questions and we hope discussion. Thank you and over to you, Raza. Um, Catherine, thank you very much for inviting uh, me to speak. It's a real pleasure and a, a privilege uh, to do so. So I'm just going to uh, sketch the litigation that ended up with the Supreme Court's judgment uh, last Wednesday. Um, but I'll start with that judgment and just say to you what I think the most important features of that judgment are. And I think there are three points, really. Um, the first is the framing, the way... The, what is what what they say what the court says is a core principle of international law namely namely non reforma how they frame that core principle because the case itself was simply about article 3 of the echr but through about midway through the hearing lord reed the president asked me a question about the refugee convention and i said of course yeah that that argument is available to us and then a sort of penny dropped as he was asking me this question. I said, of course, look, you've also got ICCPR, Article 6, Article 7, as interpreted by the Human Rights Committee. You've got Article 3, torture. He'd mentioned that, actually, Article 3, torture. And you've also got custom, custom international law, which the, the, the judgment obviously uh, talks about and says is a good good argument that, that this is also CIL. I think that that argument is absolutely unanswerable, even though... Um, the only prominent uh, uh, op opponent of that is Professor Hathaway because he's wedded to you know, a legally positivistic uh, outlook. But it seems to me that the CIL argument is unimpeachable. The debate really is whether or not this is just cogens. And obviously, as your, your listeners, everybody will know, you can conceive of international law as sort of having a tripartite structure where just cogens norms are at the top that can never be derogated from, give rise to all sorts of obligations on states uh, across the world, then there's customs, customary international law, norms of law which don't depend upon treaty ratification uh, and treaty. And the importance of, of um, CIL, custom, is that it forms a source of our common law in our judicial system. And unless there's a contrary statutory provision or some constitutional objection to receiving that norm in our domestic law, it not only forms a source of common law, but also a part of it. And the court obviously was at pains to say that, look, you have got this core principle embedded in our domestic law through um, multiple different statutory uh, provisions, include, and also the immigration rules, which they didn't really talk about, and they didn't need to. Um, but that, I thought, was really important, given the political heat around Article 3, ECHR, um, 
And yeah, as I so I think that is really important. Youth cogents is where the argument is, it seems to me. Um, Lauter Pocht in Bethlehem in, in, in the UNHCR, Volker Turk, Erica Feller, Francis Nicholson book, fantastic book. Um, and I think the Swiss Federal Office very recently has said that it's a Jus Cogens norm. The reason why uh, the court says it, um, that it's not going to reach a concluded view about the CIL, CIL issue uh, because it didn't hear argument on it was because uh, the reason it didn't hear argument on it was because it just wasn't an issue in the case. And, uh, you know, I addressed it in response to a, a, a question which uh, Lord Reed raised. Um, Tom Hickman, in fact, has also written an excellent article. He's a fantastic public lawyer. He's written an excellent article on this issue in the London Review of Books, uh, which is well worth uh, looking at if people are interested. The second main thing about this um, judgment of the Supreme Court is I think it's um, emphatic underlining of the importance of the court's role in assessing assurances and its rejection of the rather odd idea which the government was pressing and which was adopted essentially by the divisional court that you can have a non-binding, non-enforceable bilateral agreement which somehow displaces the court's role in assessing compliance with a binding, enforceable, bilateral or multilateral, doesn't matter, treaty obligation, especially in circumstances where that non-binding, non-enforceable promise is designed to secure the binding treaty obligation. And that, I think that is really important because the Divisional Court had said that um, absent compelling evidence, quote unquote, um, the court could not go behind the Secretary of State's uh, view that Rwanda uh, would comply with the assurance, um, comply both in terms of good faith and comply in terms of ability and deliverability. And the court rejected that. And I think that's you know, very, very important that it's viewed these, no, these non, the non-binding, non-enforceable arrangement as relevant, but not dispositive of, of its role. And the reason I'm laboring this point is because it had been seen as more or less dispositive of the court's role by the divisional court. And that was the fundamental argument which the Secretary of State was advancing together with arguments such as, well, look, it's this whole issue is predictive and therefore effectively we should get the benefit of the doubt. And that obviously reverses the precautionary and preventative principles that apply in the context of non-reform law, precisely because um, the harm that people would suffer if they waited for a post hoc remedy is, uh, quote unquote, irreversible. Nobody has a time machine, so they don't mean irreversible. Literally, it's a normative idea. It's ir irreparable, perhaps a better term. Um, so um, that, I think, was really, really important. The third thing that I think was really, really important was how the court's approach to the UNHCR's evidence. Madeline will obviously talk about the UNHCR. I want to pay tribute to their intervention. It was a sine qua non of the uh, case. Um, Rwanda is a one-party authoritarian state, very difficult for human rights organisations to access its processes. Human Rights Watch, whose evidence was absolutely critical in an earlier case, the extradition case, which the court refers to, where the findings of the court were effectively that there's colossal capture of the exec of the judiciary uh, by the executive to the point that the loyalty of the judges, quote unquote, is to the party rather than to justice. Human Rights Watch evidence was uh, central um, to that litigation, yet they're not there in Rwanda. So UNHCR, who were there with 332 staff over a 30-year 30 30 period, their views were absolutely essential uh, because of their constitutional responsibility under the statute, their institutional expertise. And the divisional court had been quote unquote dismissive as the Supreme Court held of UNHCR's evidence and quite wrongly so. The Supreme Court held that particular importance was to be attached to UNHCR's role. The only quibble I have, slight quibble, was the idea that you could factor in UNHCR's institutional opposition to the Rwanda scheme, but 
you know, we can't have everything. It seems to me that, I mean, as Madeline will say, you know, your, your UHCR's uh, statute requires it to be totally independent um, of any case. And it really was a quite extraordinary uh, intervention which the UHCR made at all levels of court. Uh, anyone who's there will, 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 will testify to that. Um, so those are, the, those are three reasons, the three points I think are particularly important in the Supreme Court's judgment. The court rejected an argument uh, based upon EU law that you, there was required to be a connection between the country to which the asylum seeker uh, ha was to be sent and the asylum seeker him or herself. Uh, the argument was that EU law remained in uh, force even after uh, the the uh, Brexit transition period had expired on the 31st of December 2020 because of the way the relevant act was to be construed. That argument was rejected. Um, the reason the argument was so important was, was because, of course, EU law does require uh, such a connection. That's what I want to say about the Supreme Court, just very briefly, just to sketch some of the other issues in the litigation. A number of other arguments were run in the courts below. There was a fairness argument that was run that in substance was effect, accepted by the Court of Appeal, if not the Division Court. The only thing that the Court of Appeal rejected was that in all cases, the procedures were unfair. That's very important for what might happen next. But essentially, they accepted the fairness argument uh, or rather the unfairness arguments that were being run in the Court of Appeal. Um, we had also run a, a Vyries argument under Schedule 4 of the 2020 Act, uh, sorry, 2004 Act, um, to the effect that parliamentary approval from both houses was required of a scheme such as Rwanda. That failed for technical reasons. Um, we'd also run a penalty argument, which I think Catherine is going to talk about. Um, I just want to say something about that preemptively. Um, Catherine is, I'm sorry to embarrass her, quite brilliant academic. In, in the field, she's written the leading uh, 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 work, the, the leading article on penalty, in my view. My um, view of this is that, generally speaking, the community, academic community, UHCR as well, are behind the curve on what states are doing here, on externalization, for this reason. The dominant view, again, Hathaway, is that the moment you have expulsion, um, that negates what would otherwise be a penalty. So you can test it in this way. Imagine if we in the UK um, were going to relegate the class of people to whom this Rwanda policy applies to inferior processes in a remote area where uh, legal representation is scarce or non-existent, where the decision maker is prone to bias, where uh, avenues of appeal are either non-existent or very poor, where the courts are politically captured, where the first instance decision maker is not just biased, but prone to extra legal acts and summary removal and shipping people it doesn't like for foreign relations reasons or unpalatability, quote unquote, across the border. That's the evidence about Rwanda. Imagine if we did that in country. It's very clear to my mind that that's a penalty the moment you accept that a penalty does not have to be a criminal penalty, which is the consensus view amongst all the academics. But um, what is said against the idea that this was a penalty is that expulsion is a magic bullet. because It negates, it has the effect of negating the effect of a measure that would otherwise clearly be penal from being a penalty. And the idea being, look, expulsion is uh, addressed in Article 32 and Article 33. And my view is that there isn't enough. I mean, there were various technical reasons why we didn't take that argument up into the Supreme Court, but it has obvious resonance for these sorts of uh, externalization programs. And my view is that um, that argument really needs to be made. The strongest argument on that point, I think, comes from the Canadian Supreme Court in the B010 case where Chief Justice McClacken for the unanimous court, I'm pretty sure, maybe wrong about that, but from memory, it's a unanimous court, accepted Catherine's work, um, the work of um, Anne Gallagher, brilliant uh, anti-trafficking academic Anne Gallagher, uh, to the effect that penalty doesn't just mean criminal penalty, it means administrative penalty, and denial of access to asylum procedures would be a penalty. The get around um, in our litigation was that, oh, well, that court 
that the Canadian Supreme Court was not addressing third country processes. And that is right, they weren't. But what is significant is they didn't say, well, the removal of the Sri Lankans in that case would violate Article 33, which is what you would expect on that analysis. No, they said it would violate Article 31 because lack of access to an asylum process is a penalty. And I think some really good work could be done there uh, in terms of um, what next. Uh, I mean, that's about nine minutes, or I may have gone a bit over. Sorry, Catherine. Um, that's, I'll, I'll leave it there. That's absolutely perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and as you've given us such a perfect synopsis, I, I want to just say again that this is an utterly extraordinary judgment in terms of its strength and its clarity. Um, and I think one of the things we have to thank for that is the extraordinary work of people like you and the legal representatives for all of the claimants whose tireless dedication and commitment over the last um, two years have not just prevented removal of these individuals, um, but have also really enabled there to be a broader conversation in law and politics as to the protection offered by non-reformal um, and safe third country agreements um, from now on. And that's just what I wanted to ask a little follow-up question on, if that's okay, because there were some placeholders um, in the judgment, I felt. One you've alluded to already about customary international law, and the other was when the judges said that they weren't addressed on the question of a connection requirement in relation to the European Convention on Human Rights. I wondered if you had any reflection um, on potential challenges to safe third country agreements in the future based on either of those two, what look like potential indications in the reasoning. Yeah, I mean, I should just say, you know, I, I agree with you, Catherine, this is a really strong judgment. It goes much further than the Court of Appeal. The yeah. Court of Majority had said that they'd come to the conclusion they did with some diffidence. Uh, the master roles had said that he'd, he'd quote unquote vacillated the decision making process. Lord Justice Underhill, whose judgment is quite extraordinary, is quite extraordinary because the divisional court looked at the issue on, in, through the prism of assurances, looked at whether or not they were facially adequate to cover the problems. And if they were, didn't re they thought it intentionally thought that was enough. They didn't really address the underlying evidence. Um, Whereas Lord Justice Underhill really did. It's quite, quite an extraordinary judgment. And the master roles is also really, really superb. But the Supreme Court, as you say, go much further. They didn't have any problem whatsoever in saying Rwanda is fundamentally unsafe on all of these different indices, relying essentially on the extraordinary work of UNHCR, but also relying upon Foreign Office um, uh, uh, views and also saying for good measure that ministers don't always accept their officials advice and therefore you've got to uh, uh, couch any claim to deference on that view. Sorry, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to come to your question. In terms of um, uh, connection, I think that, that that's interesting. I think we need, again, the academics to catch up or, 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 you know, on that point. Uh, I think that um, the you know, fundamental uh, point about um, the Supreme Court judgment for fu any future third country agreements is you've got to have a very, very robust review um, of the risk issue um, by the court, irrespective of whether or not an assurance has been entered into, irrespective of whether it's a treaty. The court needs to um, very rigorously scrutinise um, the deliverability of assurances and not just by reference to what might be uh, attempted to be a hermetically sealed scheme but also by reference to the sort of wider respect for human rights I mean, it's very interesting that the court alights upon what happened what was recorded in the extradition judgment about how british police were giving uh warnings about threats to life to rwandan dissidents in british soil during the pendency of an MOU between the R Rwanda and the UK. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, the sort of need for evidential scrutiny is the thing that's underlined most heavily um, by this judgment. Thank you very much. Now, if you have questions for Razi Hussein, Casey, or any of our other speakers, please do use the Q&A box. Um, I'd like to go over to you now, uh, Dr. Garlick, if I can. So UNHCR's intervention has been described as a sine qua non. Um, it would be wonderful to hear your views on it. Thank you very much, Catherine. And really, let me thank uh, both Oxford Refugee Studies Centre, as well as King's College London, the Dixon Poon School of Law, for organising this today. 
So perhaps just to to start off, I should say uh, the clarity that UNHCR was not a claimant in the proceedings as such. We were we were a third party, which means that we sought to advise the court on matters of interpretation of international refugee law and protection standards, as well as adducing evidence uh, based on our experience and insights into conditions in Rwanda at the time. And so UNHCR's role in the case throughout, in fact, the litigation also at lower level has been in our capacity as the UN entity that has a mandate to supervise the application of the 1951 Refugee Convention worldwide, based on which we are involved in litigations in many courts. Um, and we feel this is a really important way in which UNHCR can contribute to working with states and state institutions to ensure they can fulfill their obligations. That supervisory role for international refugee instruments is uh, also articulated in the statute of UNHCR from 1950, which amongst other things also underlines that our role is humanitarian and non-political. Raza mentioned this, and I think it's really important because of course this uh, been much political debate about the ramifications of this case. And it's important to recall that really what HCR is seeking to do here is not to get involved in a political process, but to ensure that international refugee law standards and related national uh, and regional standards are also respected. Um, I'd like perhaps to, to pick up on one of Raza's points in relation to non refoulement because I agree fully with him that really this is a, a, a central part of the judgment and it will really contribute to its long term significance, I think, not only in the UK, but for many other countries in the world that might look to this jurisprudence as being a source of guidance for the interpretation of such principles worldwide. And just to say that we all, of course, also very much support the view that Non-refoulement, in addition to being set out in the 1951 Convention in uh, the International Human Rights Law Instruments, including the European Convention of Human Rights, the ICCPR, the Convention Against Torture and others, is a very important principle of customary international law. And this is widely recognized today. And it's extremely important in practice, actually, because it means that it binds all states worldwide, including those that are parties to these instruments I've just mentioned, but also those that aren't. And this is crucially significant from an international practical viewpoint, because the reality is we see that a very significant proportion of the world's refugees today are hosted in countries that are not contracting states to the 1951 convention. But it's really important that non refoulement is being thereby reinforced as a customary international legal principle and being articulated and relied upon in, a, in an important, a crucial judgment of this kind. Um, I'd like to turn to perhaps three other aspects of the judgment, which I th think are particularly significant from our viewpoint. And uh, the first one relates indeed to the standards that the court has spoken to, which need to be met before an asylum seeker can be transferred to another country. And the court referred there into the ECHR decision uh, in Ilias and Ahmed against Hungary, noting that that decision makes clear that a state party to the European Convention can't remove asylum seekers to a third country without determining their asylum status, unless it has established that there are adequate procedures in place in that country to ensure that their asylum claim, claims are properly determined and that they don't face a risk of refoulement to their country of origin. The court actually uh, quoted uh, the European Court of Human Rights by noting that, and I quote, the national authorities must carry out of their own motion an up-to-date assessment, notably of the accessibility and functioning of the receiving country's asylum system and the safeguards it affords in practice. And this, of course, means that there needs to be a thorough examination of the accessibility and functioning of the receiving country's asylum system and the safeguards available in practice. And this is really important, not only in the framework of the UK and indeed the European Convention on Human Rights, but the safe third country concept more broadly, which is uh, as it is understood and applied in different parts of the world. It's crucially important for us, I think, that the court has uh, emphasized the very high standards that have to be met before states can consider transferring asylum seekers to other countries. Um, 
let me turn to a second point, which relates to indeed UNHCR's mandate and expertise as, as referred to in the judgment. Because indeed it, it was uh, from our viewpoint, uh, uh, gratifying to hear that the court, the Supreme Court in contrast to the divisional court's findings that our evidence carried no specific weight has agreed with the Supreme Court that HCR has a level of expertise and authority, which means that it can contribute significantly to the deliberations of courts and its uh, evidence and views should be regarded as such. The Supreme Court quoted Lord Carr in E.M. Eritrea of 2014, um, where he referred to the unique and unrivaled expertise of UNHCR in the field of asylum and refugee law. And indeed, you know, UNHCR performs many functions in different parts of the world, um, many much attention, I think, is sometimes focused on the humanitarian assistance and the uh, other work we seek to do at field level. But I think this emphasis on the mandate role that UNHCR performs and its authority as a source of guidance on international refugee law is really important. And this derives in part from our active involvement in important cases, uh, discussions with states about legislation and how this can be uh, interpreted and put and applied in practice, which we hope does give us insights into ways in which states can ensure that their practice is in line with international law in a positive way. Um, a third point I want to make is, is an important one for discussions of what is going to come next. And this is the parts of the judgment which underlined that there is not going to be any quick fix to remedy the flaws in the MEDP arrangement. The court underlined uh, with some, in some detail that the necessary changes that would need to be made to ensure that such an arrangement could conform with international law are not going to be straightforward and that the changes that would need to occur in the Rwandan asylum system would need to be extremely far reaching. They would require an appreciation that the current approach is inadequate, a change of attitudes, extensive training, monitoring, and a number of other steps. It's important to note also the court uh, affirmed that the government of Rwanda, in its view, had entered the arrangement in good faith. And it also found that the structural changes and capacity building that would be needed to eliminate a risk of reform in that country may be delivered in time in the future. And this is very important because uh, Rwanda uh, is to be encouraged to continue to try and improve its asylum system. But crucially, the court underlined that those conditions are not in place and it would be a very extensive and far reaching change that would be needed to allow, enable those standards to be met. Um, I want to also make a brief point about a further uh, aspect of, of the arrangement that's uh, additional to the points made by the court on the specific questions before it in this case. And this is a point that UNHCR has made strongly in its analysis of the MEDP, including in, in public statements. And this relates to the question of responsibility sharing. Because from UNHCR's viewpoint, we want to underline that even if the Rwandan system had, at the relevant time, afforded all of the necessary guarantees and standards, in order to be legal, such an arrangement would need to fully respect the principles of international cooperation and responsibility sharing as they are reflected in the preamble to the 1951 convention. It remains inconsistent with the spirit but also the letter of the 1951 convention to transfer asylum seekers to another state in a way that seeks to divest the transferring state of its legal obligations, or in a way that overstretches the capacity of and places unreasonable demands upon the capacity of the receiving state with the result that refugees would be denied access to protection and to standards of treatment in line with international law. And as the proposed arrangement under the NEDP was destined to ensure that all of the asylum seekers arriving by boat, virtually all of those entering the UK at the moment would be transferred out. This is highly problematic in responsibility sharing terms and is at variance with the 1951 convention in our view. And I just want to make that point because I'm mindful that new legislation envisages that all of the UK's responsibilities towards refugees could be outsourced to a country like Rwanda. 
and as such, this is a very challenging point with regards to the principle of responsibility sharing. Now, UNHR has underlined unequivocally its relevance, its readiness to continue to work not only with Rwanda, but also with the UK to help the UK address some of the challenges it faces, including with its asylum claim backlog, its limited reception facilities, challenges around return of people not in need of international protection and others. And from our viewpoint, we do see that there are important ways in which these challenges could be addressed through the right investments and political will in ways that would reflect international law and would bring about much better outcomes for the uh, people who are seeking protection in the UK as well as the host communities. We're also saying this mindful that the number of asylum seekers in the UK at the moment are low in absolute terms, but also relative terms, relevant, relative to past numbers, relative to population, relative to other countries in Europe, but not actually relevant relative to numbers in other countries, including in the Middle East, in West and East Africa and elsewhere, compared to which they are very small. Um, just I'd like to say a couple of words, Catherine, perhaps also about, about next steps, because I think it's important as we, as we look at what uh, is likely to emerge as discussions on the way forward in the wake of the judgment. We've, we've seen in the media that the Prime Minister is proposing the conclusion of a new treaty with Rwanda to be to be signed very soon and potentially to be ratified by Parliament, and that there is foreshadowed that there would be new legislation also in connection with this arrangement. There seems to be very little information available about these proposed next steps at this time, but I think there's a few important elements that need to be borne in mind, which are very clear. And the first one is that states can't, of course, contract out of their international legal obligations, including under refugee law or international human rights law or regional conventions such as the ECHR. And a second key point, I think, is that they can't shield bilateral agreements from the scrutiny of the courts, or at least not for the purposes of allowing them to commit significant violations, including of fundamental rights. And a further point, I think, is that any legislation that would foresee all people coming to the UK being denied access to the UK asylum system would uh, uh, raise serious questions about compatibility with international law and the principles of responsibility sharing I've just referred to. So we uh, do expect and hope that any new developments are going to take account of these factors, regardless of political considerations or priorities. In terms of some of the next steps that HCR will be taking, as I've said, we, we remain committed to working both with the UK and Rwanda to support uh, measures to try and address their systems in line with international law. And that remains the case also very much with Rwanda. It's a mandate role to seek to support states to develop their capacity. And we're committed to try to ensure that refugees everywhere can have access to the effective means to ask for and receive asylum. But we do this not to facilitate other states' convenience or priorities, but to promote the protection of refugees and upholding the standards of international refugee law. I'd look forward to receiving any questions and to the discussion that's going to follow. Thanks again for inviting me today. Thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you very much for highlighting the, the argument around international cooperation and, and the preamble of the Refugee Convention. Um, and I just wanted to ask a follow up question on that, if I could, because that was one of the issues that was adjudicated on in, by the Canadian Supreme Court when looking at its arrangements between the US and Canada. And UNHCR has a, a guidance note on bilateral uh, and multilateral transfer arrangements, which sets in place the guarantees that such arrangements would have to have for individual asylum seekers. And of course, one of those relates to um, international cooperation and protection and the broadening of the protection space. And I wondered um, if you were able to share your thoughts with us on whether or not some kind of connection requirement between the asylum seeker and the jurisdiction that they were going to be removed or deported to um, should form part of that analysis. Because of course, one of the things that's very different about the UK's arrangements with Rwanda to the UK's previous arrangements, either within European Union or with the arrangements between the US and Canada, is that this is sending people to a, a jurisdiction which they could not have traveled through or are very unlikely to have been able to access protection in on their way to the UK uh, and to which they had uh, no connection at all. Yes, thank you, Catherine, for that question. It's a very important one. 
So UNHCR has consistently advocated very strongly for the uh, existence of a meaningful link or connection between an asylum seeker and any country to which his or her transfer would be envisaged. And we think this is crucially important for not only the principled uh, soundness of such arrangements, but also for their sustainability. If people are going to be able to find protection and to uh, enjoy long-term solutions in another country, then this is greatly facilitated by the existence of a connection or link. But such a connection or link can be broadly interpreted. One of the most important and uh, obvious ones that we, we refer to is that of family links, the presence of family members in such a country. It can also comprise cultural or linguistic ties, previous stay of, of a meaningful length, um, or other forms of connection. So uh, there's, 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 there's not a hard and fast formula as to what those links are, but we certainly do advocate for the importance of this. And I mean, for some of your listeners who are uh, on in the European Union, perhaps it's a noteworthy thing to note that there was a lot of discussion and debate recently around the EU pact on legislation and asylum, which includes discussions of a new asylum procedures regulation on precisely this question. The current asylum procedures directive does require the existence of a connection before the safe third country rules can be applied. And there was negotiation and discussion in the council in particular about whether this should be retained. And what we understand in the council common position agreed in June of this year is that it has indeed been retained. And so it seems likely that this is a principle that's going to be maintained as a matter of EU law as an obligation that states have to uh, include in any arrangements around to transfer, which is a positive thing. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Professor Costello. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to follow Raza and Madeleine in their interventions. Um, I think my views on the judgment have really uh, crystallized because um, Catherine Bridick and I, Dr. Bridick and I had the opportunity to uh, write a response on the Verfassung's blog where we uh, outlined our reaction. And in a way, I think uh, our reaction is, is very much ad idem to what we've heard already on the panel for a, just a very obvious reason, which is that the judgment rests on very solid well-settled legal principles um, applied to a, a very strong body of evidence. And so once the correct framing is applied, once the correct legal principles are articulated, um, you know, the outcome of the ruling in a way is, I mean, I'm not going to say inevitable because of course it was immensely contested and it could have gone the other way given the way the ruling in the divisional court and the court of appeal went. Um, but you know, there's, um, I think the key question then was framing. So in the sense that, you know, of all the possible legal arguments that could be made, non refoulement is the most well settled point in international refugee law and international human rights law here. Um, and as Raza mentioned, it is really notable the way that the court understands this as a principle that is embodied in a number of international treaties that the UK has ratified, and also always stressing, and I found this noteworthy, the number of other states that have also ratified those treaties. So states that the UK might want to cooperate with, for example, but that, that those specific treaty provisions are instantiations of a principle of non refoulement And as was mentioned also significantly, this acknowledgement that the UK itself acknowledges the customary status of non refoulement um, and then in terms of the evidence in relation to Rwanda, as was stated, the evidence that is provided by UNHCR proves to be crucial. Um, to my mind, it was also really uh, striking that in assessing the safety or not of Rwanda, that the uh, court paid attention to the recognition rates in the Rwandan system, because courts don't always do that when they're looking at whether a country would be safe. Uh, but here, because there were uh, instances where uh, populations, nationalities, where one would expect normally very high recognition rates, given what we know about those countries of origin, that the Rwandan asylum system didn't recognize these claimants at all, that this was evidence of the lack of safety, that there was no uh, substantive asylum system that um, was in operation in Rwanda. 
So in terms of its um, content, I think the reason that we called the blog uh, Supreme Judgecraft is that, you know, an apex court can really choose in a ruling to go wide or go narrow. And the, in this instance, the court, for good reasons, chooses to go narrow. The good reasons might well be anticipating a political backlash. And so it's also noteworthy that the opening paragraphs insist that this is a ruling on legality, not about the political desirability of these practices at all. So this very strong assertion that this is a legal assessment. In some ways, to my mind, the strongest rebuke in the judgment is for the divisional court, which had really focused um, on whether the um, Home Secretary was entitled to rely on these uh, assurances and took a very flabby, weak approach to judicial review, a highly deferential approach, which um, to my mind and to the mind of the Supreme Court is entirely inappropriate in cases um, involving human rights and non refoulement in particular. Um, so I think to that extent, this is what I would characterize as a minimalist judgment, but it's minimalist with markers for these points that the court leaves reminding us that they were not argued but are significant, very explicitly custom. The court says we don't need to decide about this, but it's clearly reminding uh, both lawyers and the UK government that they're in a terrain where principles of customary international law are engaged. Um, I think on safe third country, there are features of safe third country practices that remain to be argued. Um, I think there have been two mentioned already, but just to reiterate, I think that's the connection question and whether there are um, ways to understand a connection requirement as a legal requirement. Um, at the moment, it's certainly a legal requirement in EU law, but whether it's a legal requirement more generally, I think that's something where legal scholars can probably think and contribute to the analysis. And then whether safe third country agreements to be legal um, have to cohere with the overall object and purpose of the Refugee Convention, which after all in its preamble acknowledges that the grant of asylum may place an unduly heavy burden on states. So the instrument is actually premised on a type of international cooperation where, yes, asylum seekers and refugees actually may find themselves uh, transferred to other states, but in order to enhance the overall capacity of the system to provide protection. Um, and in fact, the second paragraph of Article 31 of the Refugee Convention makes a nod to this because it, and it actually talks about refugees being enabled to leave and one state to enjoy protection elsewhere. And so this idea that the cooperation might have to be consensual, or at least was understood at that point in time to be in likelihood consensual, actually taking into account the choices and preferences of refugees or asylum seekers. Um, but certainly that overall it should be a cooperation which enhances the availability of asylum. I think that is something that coheres with the object and purpose of the Refugee Convention. And so that's something I think that can be argued on another day. And as was mentioned previously, there's some helpful uh, points in that regard um, in uh, recent rulings from the, uh, a recent ruling from the Canadian Supreme Court. But I think it can be argued as a matter of treaty law as well as um, a matter of practice. There are two other legal principles that aren't really considered in the ruling. I think for good reason, as I said, because this is a minimalist ruling, which is a good thing from an apex court under pressure. Uh, but the two points I think that nonetheless have both legal and ethical significance relate to non-discrimination and non-penalization. So I wanted to pick those up in conclusion. So non-penalization, as was mentioned, is in the Refugee Convention in Article 31. As Raza very kindly mentioned, this is an article that I uh, have written about, mainly together with uh, Dr. Yulia Yoffa, who's at um, UCL, and Dr. Teresa Buxel. Um, and when we uh, examine the Article 31 um, practice and jurisprudence, um, you know, I think it is quite clear that non penalization doesn't only mean criminal penalties, and this is best understood as sort of a very material functional conception of penalization. And to be honest, the argument that started to float around from the British government at the lower instances, uh, arguing that if something entails removal from the territory, it can't be ever considered as penalization under Article 31 just struck me as grasping at straws. 
it has a little bit of scholarly support, I think, in, in, a, um, in, in, in one uh, scholarly analysis. But it seemed to me that this was being uh, kind of really distorted um, in the way that this very uh, uh, strict separation of the scope of Articles 33 and 31 of the Refugee Convention was being portrayed. Uh, so I do think removal sometimes entails penalization. And then, of course, we know, again, from other apex courts, that in some instances, procedural disadvantages that are placed on claimants who arrive irregularly do fall foul of Article 31. Uh, so I really felt the divisional court didn't give those issues um, any adequate scrutiny. And that's something that can be argued also on another day. Um, also with uh, Yulia Yoffa, um, I wrote in the Oxford Handbook of International Refugee Law a contribution trying to make an argument a little bit more generally that non-penalization isn't only in Article 31 of the Refugee Convention, but there might be a wider general principle of in international law around non-penalization, which again does have some judicial foundation, but would be a more sort of um, a, a wider argument. Um, of course, I completely understand that, you know, at a certain moment in time, more creative legal arguments that push the envelope on progressive understandings of the law are just not appropriate, right? First of all, because they might not be necessary to win the case and to actually clarify the legal points at stake. And so there are very good reasons why courts don't need to indulge um, every progressive argument in particular circumstances. Um, but nonetheless, I think these points really matter uh, in terms of penalization and certainly the responsibility sharing question about safe third country um, arrangements. Those are matters of really significant salience more generally for the global refugee regime. So I would really think that we can do some work on those. Um, then on non-discrimination, I think here we have a really underexplored aspect of the Refugee Convention. I mean, in a way, the Refugee Convention is an instrument which is permeated with this non-discrimination ethos. Um, it has a very strong non-discrimination um, provision in it, and it really sought to ensure that a refugee protection wasn't only being accorded to the favored refugees or the invited refugees, for that matter. Um, and so with Michelle Foster, I've, uh, prompted by Catherine Bridick, who works on uh, undoing discriminatory borders, we had the opportunity to reflect a little bit about the non-discrimination provision in the Refugee Convention and how that could also be read in light of CERD and in other international legal instruments. But one of the arguments that's certainly worth reflecting on is the fact that if, if states single out um, those refugees who arrive irregularly, for harsh treatment, that might not only be a, a penalty being imposed on them, but given what we know about the way legal uh, travel opportunities are mal distributed in this world, it may actually be uh, reflecting existing racialized hierarchies about the global maldistribution of uh, mobility opportunities. It won't always be the case, but I think there are certainly instances where those kind of arguments are at least uh, worth raising. So maybe then to conclude, um, there are legal arguments for another day, and they certainly matter uh, in the sense that they matter uh, in relation to how policy should evolve in this area. And there is a space now, having clarified this very minimalist set of legal principles, to have a serious discussion about responsibility sharing. Unfortunately, the response of the UK government really shuts that down in a way. Uh, because rather than saying, OK, now we're constrained and the constraints are clear and we respect the Supreme Court because this is, after all, Britain and Britain is you know, a country which adheres to the rule of law. Uh, instead, we have this political reaction which throws uh, you know, deep dis disrespect uh, on the content of the ruling. And so I think this is a wider discussion for British constitutional lawyers to have. But clearly, the idea of uh, emergency legislation in this field would be really problematic. So, you know, I suppose there are questions for British constitutional lawyers about legislative supremacy and the capacity for legislative override. Um, but even in a system of legislative supremacy, courts um, assert a right to assess what is true and false in the world. And this would be a legislative override trying to apparently uh, you know, assert a set of alternative facts 
And that's something I think that would be of grave constitutional concern in any constitutional democracy. Uh, the other issue then would be, well, what about the international legal consequences? And that's where I think the points about custom and potentially uh, non refuma as a norm of um, Jus Kogan's really could come into their own. And of course, it means that British judges have another set of tools at their disposal because, you know, custom is a source of law in the UK. The UK is a dualist regime, but there's a creeping monism increasingly in most dualist systems. Um, and I think it also matters for questions about cooperation. So I think if states are to cooperate with each other, um, and they can cooperate in order to manage um, uh, arrivals and to share responsibility for people, um, I think you know that cooperation has to be done in a way that's respectful of international law. And states that flout international law, I mean, in one way we could think about, well, the duties of third states and whether you, know, you then become an undesirable partner for cooperation um, because you yourself are not respecting these principles of international law. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I think it's worth pointing out that your work on non reform has actually been quoted by the UN Special Rapporteur on trafficking. So as well as having um, it kind of international uh, significance within the scholarship, it's also being put, picked up by those involved directly in holding states accountable in these issues. Um, but my question for you, if I can, if I can just push you on the potential consequences of the, the government's response. So we would potentially be looking at a kind of direct legislative overruling of a factual finding, which as you've hinted is has quite significant constitutional implications. And this is against the backdrop of provisions of the Illegal Migration Act, which is not yet in force, but which seeks to disapply sections of the UK's Human Rights Act, which in turn incorporates the ECHR. So there seems to be a broader uh, trend within uh, UK um, legislation and proposed legislation that's trying to oust the role of courts in upholding um, individuals' rights. I wonder what you thought of that, either from the perspective of domestic or international law. Um, I mean, I think all of the British lawyers um, who are tuned in, you know, probably have uh, recall studying British Constitutional Law 101, which says legislative supremacy, but you know, we know the courts read down ouster clauses. We know that many uh, of the most esteemed judges present and former in the UK have both in court cases and extra curially have always said, you know, this constitutional principle of legislative supremacy has to reconcile itself with the set of constitutional principles around the rule of law and legality. And wise British governments and parliaments choose not to push it to the limit, right? And then the question is, what happens if a government pushes it past the limit? And so judges, many common law judges in the UK assert a residual constitutional power to certainly read down, read around, or potentially even read away uh, offending statutory provisions. So that's one angle, but of course, it doesn't have to come down to uh, legislation versus the courts, there has to be a whole process. So, you know, if a government proposes legislation framing this matter as an emergency, it will have to go through Parliament and the concept of emergency is an international legal concept. I don't think I'm on shaky legal ground saying this is not an emergency in international law. So that's a problem. Then we have parliamentary procedures and excellent parliamentarians in the Joint Committee of Human Rights who would have to scrutinize this. This is not legislation that reflects an election promise, in fact, quite the contrary. So the conventions of parliamentary procedure wouldn't protect it from the most robust aspects of scrutiny. And then the House of Lords would be engaged and could delay this legislation. So it's not a foregone conclusion that any legislation would go through. Um, I'm always very curious in these instances about the position of government lawyers. You know, there have been resignations from very senior civil servants through the cro this course of this authoritarian turn in British politics. And I admire people who speak out and who resign at a certain point if they feel that as individual civil servants or advisors to the government, they're being put in positions that actually undermine constitutional values in the particular country concerned. So, you know, I think there, I mean, just historically, uh, wise British governments don't push the limit of legislative supremacy to uh, undermine the rule of law in toto, 
And so the question is, you know, is this a wise British government or is this just a, the last gap, gasp of a desperate and relatively incompetent British government, in which case, you know, by the next election, we'll be talking about a very different situation. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our three speakers.